Metaverse 2030, a narrative by Louis Rosenberg, adapted by the ODPA, performed by Tin Whistle Productions, featuring Sam Garrich, Sarah Hansman, and Oliver Bailey Davies. Sound design and production by Simon Prince of Hot Sauce Productions. It was a tiny room no larger than a walk-in wardrobe. A small woman in a crisp white lab coat stood beside a large optometry machine, its smooth black surface covered in silver dials and knobs and levers. Flipping between settings, she asked, Better or worse? Better. Rang a voice from behind the contraption. Brighter or darker? Brighter. Perfect. The woman pulled the machine forward, revealing Gordon Pines, squinting as the overhead lights suddenly came on. Balding with grey stubble, he looked older than his 68 years would suggest. He also looked tired. That's because he was tired. Exhausted from the simple act of leaving his small apartment and venturing out into the busy city. It had been his home for three decades, but somehow it just didn't feel familiar anymore. Follow me. The technician led Gordon out of the tiny exam room. It was one of many such rooms on the far side of a busy carbon reality store. They crossed the busy showroom that was bustling with activity. Dozens of customers tapping and swiping in mid-air as they tried out features and functions that Gordon couldn't see. Quite a racket you've got here, convincing perfectly rational people to pay good money for empty space. <laughs> they passed a circle of kids playing on the floor. A small boy standing in the centre was reaching upward, breath held and eyes wide. Go, 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 go. Come on, let's do it. The other kids chanted as he got onto his tippy toes, a tense moment, and the boy opened his hand, exhaling with relief. Hoots and cheer erupted all around. Gordon just stared, confused by what he couldn't see. This way. Gordon followed to a wall of glass with a bright room beyond. It reminded him of the room he peered into 35 years ago when his son Laurie was born, filled with infants being warmed and swaddled. Of course, there were no newborns here, just tanks of steaming liquid, dozens of them, each with a laser aimed into the fluid. Gordon watched as the flickering beams etched out precision sets of contact lenses, each pair robotically lifted from its tank, then washed, dried, and deposited into small white jewellery boxes. Is this really your first pair of carbons? Gordon gazed through the glass, watching box after box roll down a sleek metal conveyor. Yeah, I finally surrendered. My son's been hounding me for years. Uh, my grandkids too. They say I'm uh, missing out. But that's just code for not fitting in. <laughs> Gordon wasn't kidding. This didn't feel like a choice to him, but a requirement. Imposed by a world that was rapidly moving on without him. That's when he noticed a teenage girl being handed a little white box by a sales assistant. Do they have night vision boosters? An instant replay? Those are carbon 14s. They have everything. He pointed the girl towards a dressing room to try them on. That's when Gordon was handed his own little white box. He just stared, frozen. Don't worry, it's plug and play. Gordon sat at a smooth white counter in a small white dressing room, a large mirror directly ahead. A nervous breath and he opened the white box, revealing two contact lenses, black as charcoal, and a pair of tiny wireless earphones. That was it. Nothing else. Certainly nothing that looked like instructions. Now what? In response, a green light began flashing on the earphones. Gordon pondered a moment, then grabbed them and popped them deep into his ears. Greetings, Mr. Pines. Can you hear me all right? Gordon nodded, motion sensors and the earphones detecting his reply. Stupendous! I'm so excited to meet you. Gordon grunted, sceptical. 
That's when one of the lenses began glowing inside the box. Go ahead, touch it. Gordon stared for a moment, then slowly reached for the lens. The instant he made contact, the lens clung to his fingertip by electrostatic attraction, still ink black, but now oddly reflective. Well done. Now put it in. Gordon lifted his finger, guiding himself in the mirror. But then he stopped, unable to touch his own eye. A little closer? Closer. You can do it. Feeling pressured by the voice, Gordon forced his finger forward until, snap, the lens leapt from his finger onto his eye, propelled by electrostatic charge. Then, as if by magic, the lens brightened for a moment before going perfectly transparent. Nicely done! Gordon smiled, although he'd never admit it out loud. It actually felt good to be praised by the product he'd just purchased. So much so, he eagerly reached for the other lens. It took a few tries, but he got it in, this time, without any coaching. You rock! Now, double blink. Double what? Blink twice, fast. That's how you turn them on. Gordon blinked, then flash. A glowing yellow grid appeared across his vision. It began as a flat sheet, but quickly moulded itself to the contours of the room, coating the smooth white walls and counters. Another flash, and the grid melted away, replaced by virtual visual overlays. The drab walls were now covered by elegant velvet wallpaper, the plastic counters replaced by rich mahogany. The laminate floor now Italian marble. Whoa! Amazing, isn't it? These are carbon 14s. Everything is spatially registered with near perfect precision, not to mention the optimized color blending. Gordon wasn't listening. He was too busy admiring the antique mouldings around the impressive oak door. It looks so real. I set your default to classic decor with Victorian accents. Of course, you're welcome to change the settings. We have over 2,000 themes to choose from. That's when something small fluttered into Gordon's view. For a moment he thought it was a hummingbird or a dragonfly. But then he saw it was a tiny woman with glassy wings. I'm Una. I'm here to help. You're a fairy. Technically, I'm an elf an electronic life facilitator. But because your settings are Victorian, my aesthetic defaults to the fairy genre. Do you want to reconfigure me? What? Why? Because I'm not just any elf. I'm your elf. Una fluttered closer, now hovering inches from Gordon's nose. Only you can see me, so you might as well configure me the way you want. But why? What's the point? I told you, I'm your electronic life facilitator. Life is hard these days with so many places to go and things to do. Endless details to keep track of and decisions to make. My job is to help you with, well, all of it. Gordon just stared, speechless. Una fluttered toward his right ear. This is where I usually hang out. From here, I can assist without getting in the way. Gordon eyed his reflection in the mirror, dumbfounded by the cute little fairy floating over his shoulder. Not knowing what else to say, he asked, So, can I go home now? Of course. Let's get your halo installed first. My what? Your status halo. It's how you present yourself to the world. When Una snapped her fingers, a large glassy dome appeared over Gordon's head. His name, Gordon T. Pines, glowing upon it. Along with his age and interests, his favourite music and movies, there was even a mention of his profession. Retired school teacher. People will see all that. It's just a default. We can add whatever you want. Pics, vids, animations and sound effects. No, no, no. I don't want any of that. Why not? Why not? That's when Una detected a sharp rise in the blood pressure readings from Gordon's earphones. 
Her algorithms jumped in a new direction. How about we go minimalist? Minimalist? Just your name and basic stats. We can always add more later. Fine. Stupendous! The halo condensed to just his name glowing on the glassy dome, his age and marital status below. That's when Una asked, How are you feeling right now? Okay, I guess. Two large words, feeling okay, appeared atop his halo. Gordon stared at his reflection, dazed. People really go out like this? Of course! Exiting the dressing room, Gordon's jaw dropped as he saw through his lenses that the Carbon Reality Store was now a grand Victorian marketplace with vaulted ceilings of iron and glass, ornate chandeliers hanging high above. And yet it didn't seem old-fashioned. For all around, customers were fingering glowing objects in the air. Tapping and stretching, pushing and pulling, zooming and panning. And above each person was a shimmering halo of pictures and videos, each with two bold words flashing at the very top. Feeling great. Feeling remarkable. Feeling stupendous. Amazing, isn't it? Gordon didn't respond. Too distracted by the huge glowing ads that leapt out at him as he crossed the showroom, bursting into his path with big smiling faces, pitching products he didn't want or need. Optimize your day with Smart Schedule Plus. Never forget a face with Name Whisper Pro. Trust me, Gordon, it helps you avoid embarrassing situations. Each time an ad popped out, Gordon recoiled and stepped around them. You can walk right through them, they're harmless. Gordon noticed the technician who helped him earlier. Her crisp white lab coat now swirling with wild colours, like tie-dye in motion. Like it? It's called a canvas coat. She pointed to racks of smooth white clothing, everything from jackets and trousers to scarves and hats. It's the next big thing. And they're on sale 20% off! Gordon didn't respond, his gaze finding the circle of kids playing on the floor. They were now cheering a boy in the middle, but this time Gordon could see the glorious medieval castle at the centre of the group, complete with tiny flags blowing in a sim breeze. Careful, careful! A girl exclaimed as the boy placed a sim brick atop the tallest spire. Careful! The tower swayed but didn't fall. Cheers erupting from the rest of the group. Even Gordon smiled. The city outside the shop was an explosion of colour and motion, every inch vying for Gordon's attention as he walked down the street. It wasn't just the storefronts which erupted onto the pavement with simulated supermodels strutting the latest fashions, or the restaurants that tempted passers-by with steaming plates of sim food. It was the apartments above, too. Every window was splashed with colourful nonsense, from local gossip and personal ads, to shrines to favourite sports teams and rock bands. And of course, there were expressions of political rage everywhere, mostly from paid advertisers eager to rent your window space for a generous monthly fee. It's a lot to take in. It was as if she could read Gordon's mind. Of course she couldn't. She simply had access to Data Central, the vast database that correlated the sentiments of a billion users to the dilation of their pupils and the rhythm of their gaits, even the conductivity of their skin. Using this data, Una had determined with 98% certainty that Gordon was feeling thoroughly overwhelmed. She tried to put him at ease. Change is hard. Change is for the young and the foolish. Early morning light filtered through the curtains, casting soft rays onto Gordon's bed. His eyes slowly opened and he released a lingering yawn. But before he could sit up and stretch, Una fluttered into view, hovering directly above. Happy day! She then floated to the nearest window, as if peering outside. 
They're expecting clear skies in the mid-twenties, not a cloud in sight. Gordon finally sat up and glanced around. His bedroom was now awash with elaborate digital overlays, giving his humble apartment the stately feel of an old English manor complete with varnished wood walls and an elegant stone fireplace. Last night it had seemed a bit much, even silly, but now he admitted to himself he liked waking up in such a magical place. How about the ten-day forecast? I'm good. Or the headlines? She made news clippings appear on floating panes of glass. So skillfully curated, she even highlighted an article about Gordon's beloved football team. Really, I'm good. Also, Laurie left you a message while... Give me a minute. I am still waking up. He headed for the bathroom. Una followed, hovering by his ear. It wasn't until Gordon was standing at the toilet, trousers around his knees, that he noticed the tiny fairy floating there. What the hell? What about some privacy? Sorry. She eased out of the bathroom. Then, as the sound of peeing rang out, she added, Just so you know, my sensory input comes from your carbons and the spatial database, not from the projected location of my... Una made a mental note. No bathrooms. She was designed to rapidly adjust to the needs of her host, even the quirks that defied logic. Gordon was far less adaptive. Nobody has any boundaries anymore. It's pathological. Exiting the bathroom, Gordon crossed his small apartment. His living room, now two stories tall with a library of sim books reaching the ceiling. Una at his shoulders as he wandered around, tidying up. Gordon couldn't quite see her floating there, but he could sense her presence, as you might sense an unseen person sharing a room. Although he didn't want to admit it to himself, it felt good not to be alone, especially in this apartment. Una detected the mood change from the blood pressure readings in his earphones. With her access to his full data history, including details of his wife's tragic death five years prior, she knew that loneliness and isolation were his biggest burdens. Her algorithms were already formulating a strategy to help. So, Gordy? She spoke to him as they entered the kitchen. What exciting things do you have planned for the week? A calendar for April 2030 appeared, floating beside her. Gordon had nothing planned and suspected Una already knew this. I can't decide. Skydiving or kite surfing? I think you're avoiding the question. Then, as Gordon reached for a bag of French roast coffee, she flew directly in front of him. Why not go out for coffee? Go out? I make a perfectly good latte. I'm sure you do, but you're not going to meet anyone here. Gordon scoffed and reached for a mug. Una still hovering in his face. There are seven coffee houses in easy walking distance, and three of them are frequented by single women in your age group. My age group? What's that supposed to mean? Do you want to meet someone or not? Gordon sat in the coffee house, a steaming mug in hand. As promised, the clientele was mostly his generation, mostly single and mostly women. This was no accident. As the majority of patrons had been coached here by their carbons, with younger generations and couples directed to other establishments. Setting down his coffee, Gordon scanned the room. Everyone had elaborate halos hovering over them, aglow with favourite music and movies, photos of family and friends, especially grandkids. Every so often, Gordon noticed someone stand and walk to another table, introducing themselves before sitting and chatting. We really should expand your halo. It makes you look... antisocial. <laughs> Do you want to meet someone or not? Fine, but keep it simple. Of course. With a few quick gestures, Una added bright images of his kids and grandkids, old classroom photos from when he was a teacher, even a few album covers of Miles Davis and John Coltrane as he was a lifelong jazz fan. 
And finally, the two bold words atop his halo changed from feeling okay to feeling fabulous. Gordon felt ridiculous. Why not add my medical history and my credit score? Una ignored the sarcasm. No need. But I do recommend we install Matchmaker Plus. It's only £12 per month and it gives me access to advanced romance features. What the hell are romance features? Before Una could reply, Gordon noticed a woman heading towards him. Instead of walking right past, she stopped and smiled. Anyone sitting here? Um, no. It's all yours. You're a gem. The woman dragged the chair back to her own table. Gordon slumped in his chair, deflated. Oh, fine. Install it. Stupendous! At the snap of her fingers, a tiny pink heart appeared in Gordon's peripheral vision. Another snap, and Una's wings began to glow the same pink colour. She fluttered, trying them out, which sent a puff of pink glitter into the air. This is exciting! Now what? Now this! Una sped away from the table, a trail of pink glitter behind her. Gordon watched astonished as Una blazed around the coffee house, a tiny comet darting from table to table, woman to woman, hovering over each for just a moment. And then she was back, stopping inches from Gordon's nose. There are two women here who have potential, but neither has a comp- Compatibility index in the upper brackets. I recommend extending the search. How about a half a mile radius? Um, sure. Fantabulous! Una blasted across the room and out of the front door, a steaming trail of pink left behind. Gordon expected everyone to be stunned by the spectacle, but there was no reaction at all, for only he could see Una. That's when Gordon wondered how many other little fairies were buzzing around this place, whispering in ears, nudging and coaxing and prodding. Was this really a healthy way to live? He pondered. Or was this all just... Whoosh! Before he could finish the thought, the tiny pink comet raced back into the coffee house, blazing to a halt right in front of him. I found someone! You did? She's not far! And her compatibility index is 98.7! Is that good? It's remarkable! Gordon followed Una down a busy street, struggling to keep up with her aggressive pace. On every corner, countless advertisements leapt out at him, pitching everything from vitamins and life insurance to high-fibre sheets. That's when a familiar voice rang. Gordon turned and saw his barber standing from his shop. At least, it looked like his barber. Really, it was a smart clone. Gordy, I ain't seen you in six weeks. I'll give you a trim at half the price if you jump in the chair right now. Gordon ignored him and kept walking. 60% off. 65! Gordon ploughed forward, street after street, reaching every crossing with perfect timing. This was no accident. Una... Like all elves, monitored the traffic signals, adjusting the walking speed of her host for optimal efficiency. It was a public service, ensuring everyone got where they were going without crowds building up at the crossings. How much further? Almost there. Her name is Caroline, by the way. She's 66 years old, widowed, with two grown kids. She lives in Old Town, but is currently walking her dog in the park. He's a 12-year-old schnauzer named Frankie. Schnauzer? I had three schnauzers. I told you, she's a remarkable match. Una picked up the pace, determined to get to the park before Caroline left. Fortunately, Caroline had her own elf running Matchmaker Plus, which meant Una could coordinate the encounter over wireless channels. This was important as Frankie had just completed his morning business and Caroline was about to head home. Her elf intervened, noting that the old dog was panting and might need some water. Caroline responded as expected, taking a quick break on a bench, just as Gordon entered the park. 
The place was packed with people, jogging and cycling, pushing buggies and walking dogs. It was so crowded, Gordon might have had trouble finding Caroline if not for the pink dotted line Una projected on the pavement for him to follow. I feel like Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, should I be uh, looking out for ghosts? <laughs> Caroline was sat on the bench, trying to get Frankie to drink. Don't look up, but it appears you have a suitor. Wonderful. Just what I need. His name is Gordon Pines. He's uh, 68 years old, widowed for five years. Uh, Oh, and he was a secondary school teacher just like you. Big deal. Caroline's elf wasn't a fairy like Una, but a wise old genie named Kai. His compatibility index is stellar. The best yet. I told you I'm done with Matchmaker Plus. Do you want to meet someone or not? Gordon approached slowly, feeling as awkward as a spotty teenager looking for a date. Just smile and take a breath, then comment on her dog. Nice whiskers. Mm, He's such a big fellow. Uh, Too big to be a standard, but not quite a giant. You know schnauzers? Outlived three of them. Best breed there is. (laughs) Yes. Ask his name. Um, what's the big guy's name? Frankie. He's a standard, but a very big boy. Now tell her your name. Uh, I'm Gordon, by the way. I'm Caroline. It was a perfectly polite response, but she didn't invite her suitor to sit, as was being aggressively suggested in her ear. At the same time, Gordon let Frankie smell his hand knowing it was the best way to introduce yourself to an unfamiliar dog. He then scratched behind Frankie's ears, the schnauzer indulging in the attention. He likes you. (laughs) Such a big fella. Caroline watched him closely, her gaze warming. Please sit. It'll make Frankie's day. Gordon sat, and Frankie instantly jumped into his lap. Silent seconds passed as Caroline and Gordon pretended to focus on Frankie, but really they were stealing glances at each other's halo. Gordon noticed Caroline's love for collecting antiques. Caroline noticed Gordon's passion for jazz. Then, at nearly the same instant, both said with feigned surprise, You you taught taught in a secondary school school too! too. (laughs) Snap! Some coincidence, huh? Uh, Totally random. They shared a companionable moment, both thinking this might not be a disaster after all. But then Caroline squinted as if suddenly annoyed. Gordon thought he must have done something wrong until he realised her irritation wasn't aimed at him, but at her own shoulder. No, no, those are terrible ideas. Gordon was instantly charmed, for he'd never seen anyone argue with their elf before. Sorry. Seems cliché to me, but Kai recommends we talk about our grandkids. But first, he insists I ask you what school you taught at. Well, uh, if Kai insists, um, Gillespie Secondary School for 35 years. You taught at the same school for 35 years? Did they at least give you a gold pen when you retired? Silver. Budget cuts. (laughs) (laughs) They both smiled. Real smiles. Possibly the first either had shared in weeks. Yet, both were at a loss for words. For Gordon, it wasn't that he lacked things to say. It was that people these days were always put off by his comments, discounting him as grumpy or out of touch. In truth... He just didn't understand the obsession everyone had with constant change. Lose your wife of 38 years, he wanted to tell people. Then see how much you like change. Of course, that wasn't what Una was suggesting he talk about. She was prodding him to mention his love of cricket or his fondness for travel. At the same time, Kai was advising Caroline to bring up her passion for hiking. That's when both realised they were eyeing their own shoulders for too long. They each turned back and laughed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, uh, 
Should we just talk about our grandkids? Grandkids? I was about to ask you if you've tried those new high fibre shakes. Everyone in our age group is talking about them. They shared a quiet laugh. A sim man in his 60s suddenly appeared walking towards them. Did someone mention high fibre shakes? There's a two for one special at the drink barn all week. And then he was gone. Gordon was about to make a joke, asking if sim shakes cause sim diarrhea. But his gaze was drawn to a chatty group of young parents pushing strollers, their halos aglow with rainbows and unicorns, an arms race of digital cuteness. Even the toddlers had halos floating above, adorned with rabbit ears and googly eyes and colourful propellers, each with two bold words at the very top. Feeling gifted, feeling talented, feeling sublime. As they passed by, one of the mums stopped and knelt down, softly scolding her daughter for dropping sweet wrappers onto the pavement. A totally reasonable interaction, and yet Gordon couldn't help but wonder if it was really the mum who was disciplining the girl or an invisible elf whispering in her ear. This can't be the way we're supposed to live. It can't be. And yet, nobody seems to mind. Oh, they mind? But what choice do we have? Gordon looked at her, surprised. I can't even go to the supermarket without these things. That's not a choice, it's a requirement. And really, is it any more convenient to have the prices floating next to the bread instead of printed on each loaf? Gordon was stunned into silence. Somebody finally said what he'd been thinking for years. That none of this was really properly voluntary, even if nobody would admit it out loud. Suddenly, instead of feeling sorry for himself, he felt sorry for all the busy people rushing past, glowing and glistening, moderated and facilitated, augmented from head to toe, all because they were so afraid of falling behind. Maybe this is all just growing pains. Growing pains? A mix of good and bad, but eventually we'll figure it all out. We can hope. The truth is, I have no idea where this world is headed, but I do know one thing for sure. Without these, you and I wouldn't be sitting here right now, and I, for one, am sincerely glad we are. Me too. She then handed Frankie's lead to Gordon and stood from the bench gesturing for him to join her. Together, they wandered through the park, laughing and smiling and getting to know each other. Of course, they had their awkward moments, but both were surprised how easy it was to keep the conversation going, even after they had powered off their carbons and pulled out their earphones and forgotten all about the tiny elves who brought them together for a small monthly fee. And it wasn't just while walking Frankie around that busy park, but over coffee and over dinner and over the days and weeks and years to come. It turns out, they really were a remarkable match. You've been listening to Metaverse 2030, a narrative by Louis Rosenberg, adapted by the ODPA, performed by Tin Whistle Productions, featuring Sam Garrick, Sarah Hansman, and Oliver Bailey Davies. Sound design and production by Simon Prince of Hot Sauce Productions.